with subsidies and other assistance due to the color of their skin. They lost 80% of their land and as a result of the systematic discrimination. The effects of this are still felt to this day. And in 1910, there were 925,000 African Americans who owned farms in the US. Today, there are fewer than 18,000. Greg Francis was the lead attorney representing thousands of black farmers in the largest civil rights discrimination settlement in US history. The case resulted in more than 33,000 black farmers receiving checks totaling $125 billion. His new book, Just Harvest, describes in detail the way black farmers were treated differently than white farmers and how they fought back and finally won. Joining in the conversation is Kay Rashid Nouri, one of the country's foremost minds on urban farming, a former appointee to the United States Department of Agriculture. Mr. Nouri is the creator of the nonprofit Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture. His memoir, Growing Out Loud, is also available at Acapella Books. And just a reminder to our audience, you have the opportunity to ask questions as well. Just put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to them a little bit later. Mr. Francis and Mr. Nouri, welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Brother Greg Francis, good evening, sir. Good evening, Dr. Nouri, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. You know, she started off at, at talking about the, the Juneteenth celebration. What do you think about Juneteenth? You know, I, I think it's important to, uh, in terms of awareness, and it's, it somewhat draws somewhat similar uh, thoughts that I have uh, about this case. Um, and, and simply the fact that we're now acknowledging Juneteenth as a holiday, um, I believe is a step in the right direction. There's a lot of work to be done as to what the holiday actually becomes and how significant it becomes uh, or substantive but it is a, a good step in the right direction in terms of acknowledgement and understanding that, you know, sometimes we have a change in legislation, which in this case was the Emancipation Proclamation, but, but not a change of heart by those who were governed by it. And, um, you know, that's something that we need to strive for today, which is a change of heart. Very good. Yeah, I, 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 I have a problem with it. Because it was two and a half years from the Emancipation Proclamation uh, being act activated and the time that the slaves, enslaved people in Texas knew. And so I, I wonder, are we celebrating uh, a lie, a misgiving? Uh, I just have a question about it. Here's, here's the book, Just Harvest, that you wrote. Uh, it's a very interesting book. I like where you did it because you intermixed. Uh, your personal um, gave vignettes of many of the players that were involved in in the in the struggle. And how how did you get involved in the case in the first place? Uh, my my initial involvement in the case. Excuse uh, me, Brad. Sure. Let me back up one step. Okay. This is primarily he it says it's the story of the how black farmers won the largest civil rights case against the U.S. government. It was called. Pigford versus Glickman. Uh, so get that name out so we know what we're talking about. Um, so how did you get involved in what is Pigford versus Glickman? Uh, my, my involvement in the case uh, came as a result of a relationship I had with someone you're very familiar with, Mike Espy, who was the first African-American Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, I, I had been in Mississippi opening an office uh, for the firm that I was with at the time uh, we shared some office space with, with Mike Espy because his nephew, um, actually the son of his twin sister, where I had hired at the firm. So we had a relationship there. And he began to tell me the stories of Pigford and, and what had occurred and that there, there didn't seem to be full justice because most of the farmers who had um, cl complaints of discrimination against uh, had not had their cases heard on the merits. They had missed the deadline, the six month deadline to file a claim. And this was largely as a result of what, what you talked about even with Juneteenth, lack of communication, lack of notification to the farmers, as well as just distrust of the USDA uh, on behalf of the farmers based upon the years of discrimination they had, a, a, had experienced. So Mike began telling me about the case um, 
And as the office began to grow in Mississippi, <clears throat> we had a um, uh, number of, of folks would call in and ask whether we were providing any type of representation. And then I was really moved by a, a set of brothers who had driven one from Texas, one from Oklahoma, had driven to Mississippi in order to have a conversation with me and lay out their stories. And it was just, it was, it was mind blowing to me to know that um, there had been such widespread discrimination and just mistreatment of black farmers. Well, the only, yeah, those two, you know, you only noted two right there. What was their story? What did they tell you that piqued your interest? Uh, they told me stories of just being denied uh, and, and the stories varied, you know, being denied or being delayed even in providing or receiving the, the loans and or any other subsidies in their respective places in Texas and in Oklahoma. Uh, and it just struck me because uh, they, were, they were coming from two uh, geographically different areas, but the stories seemed to be similar. Not that the, the discrimination was exactly the same, but the result was, and the result was a denial of the opportunity to even apply for a loan. We can get into some detail on that. Uh, you grew up around a farm, farming people. Is that correct? Uh, no, I did not. I grew up, I, you know, I'm originally from Panama, uh, uh, the Panama Canal Zone. And then I grew up in Orlando. So I was not really familiar with this case or the treatment that black farmers had received for, for so many years, which is why it was so shocking to me when I first heard it. If I'm being totally honest with you here, um, at first I thought that the stories were um, a bit exaggerated because I thought, no, this is, this is, you know, this is what we're talking about in, in the uh, 1981 to 1996. Of course, this type of thing wasn't going on then. Uh, but when I heard stories after stories after stories, I understood that, in fact, this couldn't have been made up, but this was exactly what was happening. Is there, any, is there a story in particular that shocked you the most? I guess that's the way to say that, yeah. Um, you know, there, 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 were, there, there were so many that were shocking, um, you know, just outright denial, uh, comments by the folks in the um, USDA office uh, indicating that they're not gonna let any N-word get that kind of money. Um, throwing the, the, their applications away right in their face, um, you know, telling them to get out, uh, given, giving the, the pr prospective uh, farmers who, who wanted to have loans uh, kind of the runaround where they would be sent from one office, farm extension office to the next farm extension office in order to place, the, um, place their application uh, and, and giving them a runaround long enough that they missed the timing for farming. So there were, there were you know, a plethora of stories, I, I, I would say. Um, different details, but fundamentally the same story. Right, fundamentally the same story that ultimately they, they, they were denied. I, you know, I, I was struck by a, a gentleman in Oklahoma who had arrived with, uh, with who I later found out was his daughter. He was being pushed in a wheelchair uh, I did not want him to wait for a very long time. So I ushered him in and decided that I would do or assist them with the claims form myself. And as I had began the conversation, I asked his daughter who had pushed him in there, um, what's his name? And she told me. Uh, and then I began asking the questions on the claims form. You know, what's the address was the next question of the farm. And she stopped me cold right there. And she said, listen, my father's here to speak for himself. And that farmer went on to tell me uh, stories of, you know, serving in the military uh, here, you know, on behalf of America and returning home to Oklahoma and being denied outright the opportunity to uh, even uh, apply for any type of loans. Um, and we finished that claims form, but what struck me about that was that I learned a lesson that day, that the daughter of, of that farmer understood what was important for these farmers, and that is for their story to be heard. To be heard after all these years of discrimination and, and, and fighting through all that, that they wanted to ensure that they told their own stories. 
Who is Pigford and who's Glickman? Uh, Timothy Pigford was a, a farmer in North Carolina who, uh, again, was, was part of uh, the, the class of folks who was discriminated against and, and denied uh, loans. So uh, uh, he, he was the lead plaintiff uh, that in, in what ended up being a class action. Uh, Glickman was the Secretary of Agriculture that assumed the role uh, after Mike Espy uh, left, left the uh, chair as the Secretary of Agriculture. So, if, and if we take a, a bit of a step back, Mike Espy, uh, at, growing up in Mississippi and being the son of a farm service uh, agent, uh, listened to stories growing up of his father um, indicating and, and sending documents to the USDA documenting the treatment that black farmers was were receiving at the time. But nothing was being done. When Mike Espy became Secretary of Agriculture on the very first day, and this is actually part of his foreword in the book, his very first day, he sent a staffer down to the basement to uncover those notes. And, um, and they did. And he read through those notes and was moved to, uh, to, to initiate an investigation within the USDA uh, in order to evaluate and understand these claims and the treatment that black farmers uh, were receiving. Uh, he subsequently um, was, was indicted on charges. Um, and I, I'd like to point out that he was found innocent on each and every one of those charges. Um, but when, once he left the department, um, Secretary Glickman, who took over, uh, decided to not uh, follow through on the plan of Mike Espy to compensate these farmers. Uh, and then that resulted in an actual lawsuit. Just for, uh, many of us may not understand what a class action is. Can you explain that? Sure. A class action is an attempt by the legal system to litigate a bunch of cases as one case. So in other words, it means that the those who are a part of the quote unquote class are similarly situated. Doesn't mean their stories are exactly the same, but they are, are, are alike enough that the, um, the case can be litigated as one case, but involving a, a, a whole class of, of individuals. Just, just for uh, full clarification, I was there. I worked with Mike Espy on these right. issues. So I have a little bit of background, but I want you to tell your story. Right. Well, that, feel free to add in, uh, you know, some of your story from the background as well. Let's see where we go on this. Okay. So uh, please explain that the specific role the attorneys played in, in both phases of the paper. There were two paper suits. One and Correct. Two. Correct. There, there were two phases of Pigford. The, the initial case uh, was in the, in the late 90s. And again, you know, I'd like to point out that this, this settlement of $1.25 billion really only addressed the discrimination that these farmers experienced between 1981 and 1996. This does not go back and look at the treatment of, of Black farmers in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, se even the 70s for that matter. Um, so, so, so this, this, this case is very uh, limited uh, in terms of, uh, of that. But in the initial case, the, um, the lawyers found, I won't say a loophole, but they found a way to um, bring these claims beyond what would normally be the statute of limitations. And that the reason they were able to do that is because the Office for Civil Rights had been taken away uh, in the USDA, um, uh, in the USDA during those years. So any complaints that farmers had that they were sending in, that any farm service agents were sending in were not being investigated at all. Uh, therefore, there was a, a, a notice um, issue that had to be addressed um, and, and, and was addressed in the claims forms. But as a result of that, they were able to extend the statute of limitations and bring the case on behalf of black farmers. Interestingly enough, and you, you, I'm sure you're aware of this, Dr. Nuri, is that many of the documents that the lawyers relied on were actually studies by the USDA, uh, studies that had been done that were um, 
clearly uh, clear evidence of systemic discrimination in the case. The initial case uh, after some litigation was settled uh, and there was, a, there was a claims period of six months. Well, again, Dr. Nuri, as you know, um, information doesn't travel as fast in rural America uh, as it does now. And certainly there was no Wi-Fi and uh, internet and that type of thing. And then I, I, I suspect to say, even in rural America, there's probably limited even today However, uh, during that, that period of time, most of the farmers who had been aggrieved for so many years um, did not file a claim within that specific period of time because quite frankly, they thought this was just a continuation of what had occurred before, kind of a bait and switch uh, type thing. So there was a severe lack of trust between the farmers and the USDA. And as a result, uh, the farmers missed the deadline to, to file their claim. The vast majority of the farmers missed their deadline to file the claim. Um, so subsequent to that, lawyers, uh, farm advocates uh, understood that there was a need to achieve full justice in this case, to have everyone who was uh, potentially aggrieved to have their, their cases heard. Uh, so there was a bunch of lobbying behind the scenes um, uh, to Congress, and ultimately in 2008, the Farm Bill included $50 million um, to potentially compensate the farmers. Now, we knew that $50 million would not be sufficient to uh, compensate the number of farmers that were out there, understanding that not everyone was going to have a successful claim, but um, we instituted a, a, a plan then to go out and reach these farmers. Uh, one of the things that I did personally as lead counsel is I wasn't going to leave it to chance as to whether the right magazine or periodical or note card was going to get to the farmers. I actually um, jumped in my car um, and, and was committed to going to small towns and drove probably tens of thousands of miles uh, or thousands of miles all across rural America, Mississippi, Alabama, um, uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, in order to get in front of the news media in some of these smaller localities um, that, uh, that so I could appear on the six o'clock news. As you know, farmers, you know, they're not watching TV all day. Um, okay. They may be lucky if they get home in time to watch the six o'clock news or someone from the family is watching the six o'clock news. And I thought it was important enough to make sure that the notice was out there, that I got on the road and, and made sure that that happened. Uh, that actually was my next question. You just answered it. When, what, what, the, what was the reaction you as an attorney experienced from various communities throughout the South? Were the farmers generally pleased with the Pigford lawsuit? And did they also seek more changes within USDA? Well, you know, the farmers refer to the USDA and still do at this point as the last plantation. Um, so they, they were certainly skeptical of the, the ultimate resolution of the case. Um, and, and in fact, you know, there was not sufficient debt relief uh, in the Pickford case ultimately. Um, that, but it was an attempt to uh, at least compensate or begin to compensate those farmers and, and or their descendants who... Um, who made claims on their behalf. Do you think that the Pigford lawsuit uh, has been impactful overall in changing the behavior of USDA staff and, and throughout, the, throughout the country? I think it's been impactful uh, in the sense of awareness that there's an acknowledgement after you pay $1.25 billion, that's an acknowledgement by the government that in fact, there was some discrimination going on and that it needed to be compensated. Um, in terms of, of moving forward now, I think it, it highlighted the fact that, that A, this systemic discrimination can go on, but B, now that we have that awareness, what are we going to do about it? Uh, Black farmers still struggle and fight with the USDA all the time. In the most recent uh, presidential uh, term uh, prior to uh, President Biden, um, President Trump indicated that he was for the farmers and he would provide a lot of aid for the farmers. And, and guess what? He did. However, um, 
Black farmers during the Trump administration received one tenth of 1% of the aid and the loans that were given. So I would say to that, you know, as they say, men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie. There's still a problem with the USDA. Uh, when you and I talked the other day, you asked me a question why I thought Secretary Espy was forced to resign. And you, you want to elaborate on that? Will you, will you address that? Certainly, you know, the, the, these I'm not a I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. However, uh, with the USDA being uh, uh, labeled as the last plantation with the history of discrimination that has gone on and was going on in the USDA. Uh, and despite the fact that that in mainstream America, we were having some advances in the areas of civil rights. The USDA seemed to be a, a, a agency that was almost immune from uh, many of the changes that were happening. Mike Espy was making serious changes there. You know, what black farmers were losing with not only their farms, but it's generational wealth of the inability to be able to pass along um, the, the farmland, the knowledge of farming, the families uh, that were broken up as a result of them losing their farms, but really losing the land. And when Mike started to address this in the Pigford case, I wasn't there, you were. I wasn't there, but it seemed to me as, as someone looking back on it is that there was a vendetta out for, uh, for Mike Espy uh, in this case and for what he was doing in attempting to compensate uh, the black farmers. And I, you know, I, I again will repeat, every single allegation of, of wrongdoing by him, uh, Mike Espy refused at every turn to uh, plead to anything. It went from you know, the 26 felony uh, counts to down to one count. They asked him to plead to one count and he refused because he did not do anything wrong. And he stood by that and ultimately a jury of his peers and to quote him, showed up and showed out on his behalf at the time of, of the verdict. I will add something here. I, and I agree, I do, you, I, I believe in conspiracies. If you and I sit down and decide to have a, a surprise party for your wife, that's a conspiracy. Right, uh, true. So when you get to that level of government, all those nitpicking accusations that they spent millions of dollars trying met Mike Espion and he was uh, found not guilty in all of them. One of the things that happened just before that was a report that came from the Department of Justice written by the Assistant uh, 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 Attorney General, Walter Dellinger, the fourth paragraph of the first page, it says the Secretary of Agriculture has authority to settle every case that there was, okay, at his there, there right. and any money that needed to be spent, he could spend it. That meant that was billions of dollars. Right. Billions right. of dollars. And they did, they, they had a black secretary who had, who expressed from day one empathy for the black farmers there wasn't any way in the world those folks at the last and the greatest plantation in government were going to allow that to happen. So you create, in my opinion, a diversion was created. And, and it was all those accusations that they put against Mike S. It was a diversion from the real issue is we're not going to allow him to settle all these discrimination cases because there were too many documents in the files that said that, yes, the USDA did discriminate. And uh, I even had it happen in my department. It was really amazing. I was one of the things that Mike did was get into the 1993 Farm Bill, uh, a requirement for the Department of Agriculture to conduct a disparity treatment. Right. To show the disparate treatment, and you know, they came on my desk, and we did, we did, but they buried it so deep that you lawyers didn't even know it existed. Right. That, that was something that, as we talked the other day, I was not even f familiar with. But, you know, it's exactly that type of, of behavior that has led to, you know, years of just discrimination within the within the USDA. Remember what I what I said kind of at the outset is, you know, there was a change in legislation that, you know, 
In fact, all farmers should be available or, or should have available to them the loans, uh, public funds for which they pay taxes as well. But there was never a change of heart for a very long time in the USDA. And I think that we're only starting now to see uh, some, some more recognition of that with the most recent stimulus bill and the $4 billion that has been set aside uh, for debt relief for black and brown farmers. You know, when I, I finished my book um, about my experiences in, in agriculture over the last 50 plus years, uh, when I stopped, as soon after I stopped writing and I was published, I started thinking about and remembering all the things that I could have put in there, didn't put in, that forgotten until I was reminded uh, by someone else. What have you learned? What, what, what would you add to your book now if you had a chance to rewrite it? What did well, you leave out? Yeah, if I had a chance to rewrite it, I, I, I would add in there uh, some of these studies that were actually commissioned by the USDA. The study that you mentioned that was buried deeply and other studies uh, that, that listed and specifically laid out the acts of discrimination. The, the, in, in the initial case, um, there were a, a, a number of uh, stories that had been told and recorded, and they're in the National Archives now, that quite frankly, I was not even aware of uh, during my involvement in the case. But I, I would love, love to share uh, some of those stories so that, you know, we, we could put more of a context to exactly what the Black farmers were experiencing and paint the picture of what they were up against. Ooh. Um, those stories continue, continue to be told and they, you can come at them from so many different angles. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm a Booker T. Washington man. Right. Okay? And people often talk about George Washington Carver, the hero that he was to the side. He's, George Washington Carver saved Southern, Afri uh, Southern agriculture. Cotton is still king in this country is still king in the South, but they have played out the soil. So you got a black man to put that together. So people sing his praises and quite often put down Booker T. Washington, not understanding that Booker T. had enough sense to hire George Washington Carver. Right. right. Uh, and as, a, as a team, they were able to do all the wonder, I mean, introduce extension service and uh, the crop rotation, all the things that they did. So there are a whole, whole lot of black folk uh, who have not gotten their full credit for the time they were many worked in the background. You got somebody like Booker T. Watley, who, who was one of the first people to institute a, a community supported agriculture, teaching uh, the black farmers how to make $100,000 on 25 acres uh, back earlier in the right. 19th century. These remarkable people. And you got to work with in this over these last years a good number of important black folk who will probably become footnotes to history. Some of them are, are well known, but many of them are just will be footnotes for the roles that they played in moving the, not only the civil rights movement along, but under that rubric, that umbrella, uh, uh, righting the wrongs of the USDA processes, you know, getting involved with the committee where and you, you give vignettes of a whole lot of those men and women in your book. Can you tell us about some of them, please? Sure, sure. You know, one of, the, one of, one of just one of my favorite people, period. And um, uh, when we initially met, it was not a, 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 a meeting of the minds initially because it was lawyers trying to kind of uh, uh, position themselves for, uh, for this case. But I ultimately got to know and listen to and speak to privately and, and, and watch him publicly, Hank Sanders from Alabama. Hank Sanders had been the longest serving uh, senator in the state senator in the state of Alabama, uh, having served for over 40 years. And Hank's story was significant because growing up in Alabama, uh, he, he tells stories of being uh, ridiculed for saying that he wanted to be a lawyer. He went on to uh, Talladega, Talladega 
University and then ultimately went to Harvard and was educated at Harvard Law School. Uh, but even with, with such a fine education at Harvard Law School, Hank Sanders was committed to his people. He returned to Alabama and continued to fight for, for so many years, not only for black farmers, just for uh, the, the, the civil rights struggle period. And you could tell that with Hank, it was not about the money. It was about principle. He could have taken his Harvard education and went, well, went elsewhere and probably made a whole lot more money. But he was committed to the, to the people and he was committed in this case. During the initial Pigford case, Hank uh, Sanders, who had been partners with J.L. Chestnut, and J.L. Chestnut was, was Rosa Parks' lawyer, um, who um, was on the phone with the NAACP office in New York when Bloody Sunday occurred and told the stories of what was going on to those in the North who were not able to see it before there was any, any TV coverage. But Hank, um, JL Chestnut and, and, and Rose Sanders um, were all partners and they grew their firm to uh, almost 20 lawyers, the largest black law firm in Alabama at the time in order to facilitate the processing of, of the claims for black farmers just a salt of the earth person that taught me not only uh, about this case and not only legal theories, but just about life. And he, he, you know, he may be a footnote uh, to some, but for me, he is, he is certainly uh, an icon. What, what are that, that's two giants that you just named. And in that list goes uh, Shirley, Shirley Sherrod had sure. a, a big role. You know, the Nation of Islam had 13,000 acres of farmland down there that we, back in the, in the early 70s. Um, that was one of my, ran, I ran those farms back then. Oh, wow, I, I, that I did not know. Yeah, me and Shirley, new communities had uh, 6,000 acres and the Georgia farm we were on was 4,200 acres. They were right across the freeway from us. So you know that upset uh, them. Okay. 10,000 acres owned and controlled by black people and they did their best to get rid of, get rid of all of that. Then they, you, know, you got the younger people, Gary Grant, uh, John Boyd. Um, you've worked with both of them, huh? Right, Gary Grant and John Boyd, great leaders in the uh, area of farm advocacy. You know, John Boyd, understanding the the uh, what what moves America uh, symbolically drove his tractor all the way to uh, Washington D.C. and then down the streets of Washington D.C. to draw attention to the plight of black farmers and the fact that their complaints had not been uh, heard for, for so very long. Gary Grant, who, and I talk about this in the book, failed as a farmer, although he grew up in a farm, just continued to fight for his parents who had been farmers um, and, and had been denied and mistreated for so long. And Gary Grant, although he wasn't a farmer, just refused to give up. And that that is kind of the you know, th those are those two are both testaments to what I have found with black farmers is that there is a resiliency and understanding that what is what is right and wrong and not giving up on that. And that's what these farmers sought for. And then just the being relentless in terms of pursuing justice, whether it is, was in the courtroom or in the halls of Congress, uh, John Boyd and, and Gary Grant would would show up and tell their stories. Yeah, I was there when he when John Boy showed up with his his mules and wagon. Secretary was there also, right out there on the uh, that would been the north side of the building. Uh, I, you traveled throughout the South, through all the states, saw the different ways that this discrimination was white supremacy was was exemplified. What about the organizations that you interacted with? The organizations that were have been involved in, in this work. Who who are some of them? There are some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful organizations. And I, you know, on the fear of leaving someone out here, I, you know, chalk it up to the head, not the heart. But, you know, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives was and continues to be just one of the leading organizations um, that, in fact, fight for uh, Black farmers uh, all the way through today. John Boyd's uh, Association of, you know, Black Farmers is another group who, another advocacy group that again has taken in the, the charge and, and lead for that. And Gary Grant with the Black 
uh, Farmers and Agriculturalists Association in, in, Oklahoma, in, in North Carolina, because there's two, one in North Carolina, one in Tennessee, but Gary Grant and his organization also was very instrumental in not only organizing, uh, but getting the word out and then ultimately also lobbying, you know, the, the right congressional folks in order to get the appropriations in place to potentially uh, provide funds for settlement in this case. Who were some of the congressional people that you mentioned in your book that were helpful? Uh, Benny Thompson in, from, from the state of Mississippi, who actually succeeded Mike Espy uh, as, as a representative from Mississippi after Mike was, uh, was, was appointed the Secretary of Agriculture. And, and, and those people who are really a part of the uh, Black Caucus in, in Congress uh, banded together, understanding that this was a problem that even if they were from an area that was not necessarily as rural or had as many farmers, but this was something that was affecting Black folks. So the, the Black Congressional Caucus was very instrumental and led the way in terms of ensuring there was legislation that would provide funds for, uh, for these farmers. Well, we're getting near the end of our interview time. Is there anything that you would like to share with the audience that I haven't touched upon? Uh, just, you know, the, 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 the farmers that we represented were descendants of, of the slaves. You know, when, when the slaves were brought from Africa to the United States, they didn't have any carry-on luggage on their, on, their, on their trip over here. The only luggage they had, that the only carry-on luggage they had was their ability to farm. And they brought that knowledge to America. And that is what I believe uh, allowed America to become the leading producer of cotton uh, and still one of the leading producers of cotton was not only the work of, of the actual slaves, but also the, um, uh, you, you threw me off there, not only the work of the slaves, but their knowledge of, of what to do. And, and, and once they were freed from slavery, um, you know, not, not much was given to the farmers in, in terms of now transitioning from being slaves to being, um, being farmers. But what they did is they banded together and they had co-ops and they cooperated with one, with, with one another. And as a result, you know, black farmers for a period of time became one of the most successful groups of entrepreneurs that we've ever seen uh, in America. They were able to, to band together and co-op and to then have the government come in and, and basically thwart or uh, discount those efforts by the discriminatory, discriminatory treatment, uh, I think is, is something that obviously needed to be addressed. You know, there, there are four things that are required to build a great nation. America, despite its problems, is still a great nation. First is the commitment of the people. And that was established, established in the Department of Agriculture, Homestead Act, uh, the Morrill Act, all these things to build the agricultural sector. Then is land, labor, and capital. The land was taken from the Native Americans. The labor was stolen from Africa. And what many people don't understand is that the capital built, used to build this country were the enslaved people. Right. I could take you to the bank and borrow money against you, and that the gross domestic product of the United States in the middle of the 19th century was primarily the bodies of the enslaved Black people. Uh, we built this agriculture, uh, and we've been kept from it in so many ways. And your book, Just Harvest, uh, and just as it says, the story of how Black farmers won the largest civil rights case against the government, and that still doesn't cover all the expenses. They still owe some money, so... Right, absolutely. I think that, you know, as I said, that this last, this most recent appropriation of $4 billion for debt relief is, again, another step in the right direction. However, there needs to be a, an evaluation of the system and, and have controls put in place that would allow uh, this discrimination to not be so prevalent and, and pervasive. Well, it's been my pleasure, brother, to have this conversation with you. Um, I wish you continued success. And if there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. Well, Dr. Nuri, thank you for having me here today and, and giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts 
on what's just a, a such a very important part of history, um, the, the history of the black farmers. You know, at one point, black farmers, despite all the discrimination and, and the lack of funds, were able to band together and provide food for 30% of the households in, in America, despite the fact that they were a much smaller percentage of the overall farmers. And to, to be able to do that and do that effectively, I think is a story, again, that needed to be told um, because I, it highlights how the government involvement ultimately uh, basically took away that entrepreneurial spirit. Excellent. Well, we do have some questions, so I'll go through them one by one. The first one is, was the discrimination just at the USDA or was it also the local banks which would be making the loans? Uh, it was both. The USDA usually becomes the, the lender of last resort. So in order to, uh, to go to the USDA, many times you had to show that you had been denied by the banks in the area, uh, which was not hard to, 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 to find because there were a few banks that were giving out these agricultural loans to uh, Black farmers. Thank you. The next question was, do you think the Black Lives Matter movement and the killing of George Floyd will have an impact on the treatment of black farmers? Well, it's a it's another example of awareness. You know, the reason I think that George Floyd was so uh, impactful for America is that we were actually able to see uh, what happened to him. You know, if there was just a story of uh, or, or, or those recounting the story of having a knee on his neck for so many, you know, for over eight minutes, that would have been one thing. And many people can't visualize that. In this case, you could not deny it. You, they were able to see it. So George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, I think is, is, is are um, precipitous to, uh, or, or will or come before the things that we need to do in order to address the discrimination in America and especially within the USDA. The next question is, there was a recent story in the New York Times that said white farmers are now claiming they are being unfairly treated. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know what, it, it, is, uh, it is distressing to me to, to, to hear that and to see that um, and, and to see that the funds for black farmers have been held up as a result of this. Certainly, you know, as a lawyer, anyone has an opportunity or a right to bring an action if they believe that they are wrong in America. That's that's our right as Americans. However, if you really examine the history of black farming and of black farmers in America, I don't think there's any denying of the systemic discrimination that they received. And, you know, the, the, the funds that are now being invested, the, the, this $4 billion dollars, uh, it's really an investment back in black farmers. It is not in any way discriminatory. I, I mentioned earlier in this in this call today that you know during the Trump administration, um, one tenth of one percent of the aid went to black farmers. I wonder where those farmers who are now bringing that case were when that was going on, and where were their voices then? You know, to deny black farmers the opportunity to have debt relief now is really just a codification or a confirmation of the past discrimination of the USDA. And I don't think that we should stand for that. Thank you. I'm gonna combine two questions because they're very similar. Um, when black farmers got their late loans and their crops either failed or were smaller, they had to sell off land and white farmers claimed that black farmers were just bad farmers. Um, and uh, then also, why does it matter if the loan is late, right? So it makes the crops fail, but what are the other uh, ramifications of that? Well, I mean, it, 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 in fact, it, it, it affects the entire system of the farm, which is, you know, in order to, you, you have to plant at the right time, harvest at the right time in order to maximize your crop and, and be ready for the next season after that. So. When the loans were being delayed, um, it would throw off the whole system uh, of farming uh, and put the black farmers at a at a disadvantage that they could not um, plant in the land and, and reap uh, what they had sowed in a timely fashion and, and to the extent that other farmers were. 
and clearly their farming skills uh, were on par with the white farmers. So Absolutely. That's not the issue. Right, right. The, the, their farming skills were not the issue at all. Um, certainly, you know, the, that was probably some of the um, excuses that were used at the time. But in fact, it was the, really the denial of the funds that, that would have allowed the black farmers to get not only equipment, but seeds and, and, and to get the proper help uh, and to expand their farm uh, if, if they were, were even becoming successful at the time. So those things kind of added together were, were really the result of all this. And what more can be done to help black farmers? Uh, I, I think that, you know, now with this awareness of the, uh, the, the Pigford case, the, the Pigford 2 case that I was involved in, and now the appropriation to, uh, to Black farmers, I think that we need to continue to advocate for them, uh, not only in the halls of Congress, but within the USDA uh, to ensure that the policies, uh, the, the government funds, the, the taxpayer dollars that are being um, disseminated amongst farmers are disseminated in a fashion that is consistent with those who want to farm um, and are out there farming. Thank you. And then the last question we have, is there any help for farmers who are discriminated for years before the lawsuit? There is not. And that, that's, that's what I talked about. The statute of limitations uh, would come into play uh, based on the, the, the timing of everything before 1981, what was significant and was kind of uh, 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 a, a, a window of opportunity between 1981 and 1996 was the fact that there was no Office of Civil Rights that could consider the discrimination that the farmers had experienced. Well, thank you. What a, what a wonderful talk. And we Appreciate your answers and your insight. And I want to remind everyone again, both uh, the books are on sale at Acapella Books. And um, thank you for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. And thank you, Dr. Nora. Thank you, Counselor. It's been my pleasure to sit here with you and have this conversation. Well, I appreciate it. Peace be.